over here. So, back onto the Army of 2000 board that we investigated prior where and this chip here was actually 9 degrees in the wrong position. So, um, yeah. And I got a new one and put um, it in the right orientation. And um, it was still dead. And the processor was showing that it was uh, no activity. It was totally weird. So I thought I'd actually go through the other chips and, and double check that they are uh, the right way around, which I had already done previously. But I thought I'd do it again, and then I, to double check the um, chip numbers to make sure that the correct chip is in the correct socket. <laughs> And um, it f I found out that um, Buster and um, oh, what was that called? So that one, yes, yeah, so it was Gary and um, Buster. They had swapped places. And uh, that was even when I purchased the board. So I went back to the original picture of how, the, how, how it was when I purchased it, when it was delivered. And it was actually the same situation. Now sadly, it, um, with that swap, it seemed to just have destroyed, <laughs> yet, yet again, destroyed the I.O. chip. So I had to change out the I.O. chip also. So, but um, now it's working a bit better. And I also investigated the reset circuit for um, this board and it's one of the earlier Amiga revisions from the perspective of the circuit for the keyboard reset. So it's the um, older one and, uh, and uh, Amiga went through several iterations tr on trying to get this um, keyboard reset um, to work reliably. And um, yeah. So anyway, we also have a guest star, a little bit more about that later. but. Um, it takes a lot of space, so sadly it's blocking the monitor a bit. But anyway, let's see if we can um, convince this thing to start. Might not have the right channel. Or did it shut itself off again? Maybe, yeah. Power itself down at the moment. So that's obviously in the wrong input again. Swap it. Yep, there we go. So, anyway, in, in, in this configuration, I have the Omega Diagnostics ROM in place. So, as you see now, it actually runs. <laughs> so, so it's like, what? <laughs> so basically, uh, initially uh, speaking, it doesn't seem to be anything um, wrong with the board. Of course, I haven't run all the diagnostics, so I'm going to do that soon. Um, show you how to do that. Um, but um, yeah, so this is quite a big step. But I was actually looking forward to doing a little bit more advanced diagnostics and maybe have to change out a memory chip or one of the TTL chips, but <laughs> this is the, yeah, it, it was good that I checked all the, all the chip numbers, but um, how, how, how that originally happened, uh, no idea, but anyway, it uh, seems like I actually have a working board, so anyway, um, so we're going to continue using the diagnostics roll and um, going to oops. So what I did is I purchased this adapter here. So this is from an Omega keyboard connector to a PS2, an old style PS2 connector. in there and then 
I have a PS2 USB adapter. So that adapts this signaling to um, a USB. And then we need. Oops! Ah, I need to actually pick up the keyboard. So I'll just pick that up. Oh, now I got the standard USB keyboard, and then we plug that into this adapter. I'm not sure how well it will work, but I mean, it'll be probably good enough to, um, to have a look at some of these menus. So, all, all green. Probably not such a good idea to run put the keyboard on top of the device. No, I think it's crashed. Let me take it from the beginning again. This is the memory test. So it really looks weird when you start it and you think that oh now it must be completely broken when you're running the diagnostics wrong but that's actually uh, when it does the initial memory testing so it's putting it's packing the video memory also with garbage or patterns to see that it's okay so no so that it's not <laughs> it's not broke ah no it didn't seem to like me having the keyboard on top of the electronics so let's see that one and press uh, simple okay there's the It's oh my neck! <laughs> really drinky looking sideways. Right. And the we'll take one more. Um, it's like the keyboard's a bit sticky. I think this is pretty much in um, in working order. Of course, I'll run more tests and then uh, and do some uh, longer-term testing, but uh, I won't do that in this video. It's too boring, but um, yeah, very slightly strange because uh, it, it was obvious that there had been um, attempts to desolder stuff and. Um, and um, replace, yeah, maybe not replace chips, but at least try to, or put extra solder or whatever. So there seems to be some evidence of rework, and then you have these chips in the wrong place, and this in the wrong orientation. I don't, I don't really get it. Well, 
That seems to work okay. Oh. And this, the, the diagnostic ROM is good because you can actually run it. Uh, you, yeah, you, you, you have it on the board and the diagnostic chip does diagnostics things from the very beginning. Uh, so even if you had an otherwise dead system, it, it, will, be, it will be trying to check memory and, and, and other, other things. So you can actually, um, uh, it's quite nice to be able, then you can, um, you can be confident it's trying to access the memory, for example, when it starts. And it will always do the same, uh, same test procedures in the beginning. So you, you, there, are, there is information online where you can find out in more detail what steps it actually takes and that can also help diagnose different problems when you have more details about the actual diagnostic steps that it takes in certain instances. So I think that was worth it. So what I'm going to do now is um, I think we will um, put back the original ROM and see if that works. Be back in a second. So, anyway, so the original um, ROM is back. Let's see if it powers up with the original ROM. Yep. Yes. <laughs> The sad thing is I've, I've ordered a physical, because I would like to test it first with a physical um, three and a half inch drive, and I've actually have ordered one, but it's that package has got um, somehow lost in space in the posted system, so I'm still waiting for that to arrive. But I think that's good enough for this um, for this phase. So we've um, yeah, wasn't much of a struggle to get to working but uh, I must have amazing that you that I could pick up such a board in, in, in such state and it's just to actually haven't haven't done any repairs on it as such so I've had to I had to get a new um, fat fat Agnes and, and um, yeah make sure it's the right way around I had to check oh. I think because of these chips being in the in the incorrect order, that created a bus short circuit, so it burnt out the um, I/O chip. So I, I can't really blame the I/O. The I/O chip was more; it was burnt out because of the. Um, so basically, just to um, get the chips in the oh, correct orientation and um, <laughs> correct chip in the correct so and that that seems to be at least working quite well. So. No, interesting. Anyway, so a little bit about our guest star. I thought I'd bring on board since um, this is obviously not going to be that entertaining as such. But I actually wanted to show show this because this is um, Tetronics 453A portable oscilloscope. Yeah, portable in the in those days. Um, it was $2,000 in 1966 and that is equivalent in today's money um, $19,000 so, so this was in today's money this was worth $19,000 <laughs> or 19,000 euro so that, yeah so not not small change um, not crap um, this has had some um, mechanical issues and is still having a few mechanical uh, mechanical related issues which I'm in the process of fixing but uh, otherwise it's in pretty good working order the the main main functional issue is that the delay potentiometer it's uh, what was it? yeah it, it has fallen apart but I actually have a new one so I'm, I might actually it is possible I may make a video about um, uh, changing that. Um, and if there's interest for it, put a comment. Otherwise, uh, it's 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 not that difficult to access. So, um, yeah. 
So what I thought I'd do is to show that this is still still a little bit, uh, it's still useful for today's, for, you know, this style of Amiga diagnostic work. So, so I'm going to reposition the camera so that so you can actually see the display and then we're going to do a few measurements and, yeah, just to show it op operating. So anyway, now I set it up to measure the 28 megahertz um, crystal signal and um, as you see, this, this is where you see that it shows the the limit so the timing's all, all maxed out and, but it still triggers and you can kind of see the waveform so, but that's um that's 28 megahertz so it's the 7 megahertz um signal and as you see that it can somewhat keep up with the with the speed but the timing's still maxed out but still good enough to do diagnostics checking So that's an address line, and that's kind of what one would expect because it's randomly going ones and zeros depending on what it's doing. That's another pin. Then we'll have a look at a data signal. Yeah. And once you get kind of used to diagnosing yeah, any kind of equipment, Commodore or anything, then you will you'll get a feeling as to, when you do it enough, then you'll get a feeling about, okay, well, in certain diagnostics, you can get to the feeling that, ah, uh, oh, that signal is looking okay, or it's not looking okay. So, for example, if, of course, then, then you have the black and white situation like this, you know, the, the address lines are stuck in a certain logical state, or the data lines are stuck in a certain logical state. But even if you have that, kind of data flickering on um, uh, you will after a while you get used to the fact that it should look something like that and if it doesn't look like that and, and if there's some very strong overlaying signal that doesn't really look like it belongs there then um, you know that you have, have some well, you know it might actually lead you down the road to figuring out if there's something in the buffering chips or general signaling that's um, not working. But I, mean, I think that one can still use this oscilloscope um, because of course the, you, you won't use an oscilloscope to figure out what data is going through the system because that you need a logic analyzer for. But you can at least do the... It's, you know, for this speed of equipment it seems like you could still use this oscilloscope quite successfully just to uh, do the basic diagnostic steps that you can use an oscilloscope for. So anyway, it looks like I've got a somewhat working system, so the next step is to, of course to build on this, you know, get the disk drive and other things in place. So if you're interested in following the complete reconstruction of this system, then um, consider subscribing. Hit the um, bell icon to get notified of new videos, and um, yeah. So, bye from my guest here also. <laughs> Still working. <laughs> After so many years. Yeah. See you in the next one.